Chapter 8, Introduction to Hypothesis Testing. Hypothesis testing is an inferential process. Inferential statistics is defined as taking sample data to draw conclusions about a population. Therefore, this process uses limited information as the basis for reaching a general conclusion. Specifically, a sample provides only limited or incomplete information about the whole population. And yet, a hypothesis test uses a sample to draw a conclusion about the population. In this situation, there is always the possibility that an incorrect conclusion will be made. Although sample data are usually representative of the population, there is always a chance that the sample is misleading and will cause a researcher to make the wrong decision about the research results. In a hypothesis test, there are two different kinds of errors that can be made. The first type of error that is possible is referred to as a type 1 error. The characteristics of a type 1 error is follows. The research rejects a null hypothesis that is actually true. A researcher concludes that a treatment has an effect when it has none. So in short, we can say that a type 1 error occurs when in error the researcher concludes that there is a treatment effect or a true difference between groups defined by a quasi-independent variable, such as males versus females. So again, we don't ever want to lose sight that we may be conducting non-experimental research, which is the comparison of groups that are defined by a quasi-independent variable. Um, in most of our cases, we'll be testing um, the manipulation of a true independent variable administering some treatment. But again, the hypothesis testing can also include non-experimental research where we're comparing groups um, that are defined or created using a quasi-independent variable. So I don't want to lose sight of that. I don't want you to forget that um, possibility. So again, a type 1 is saying that we... Um, let's say visually speaking, we have a distribution where the um, mu is in the center and we do obtain a sample mean in the critical region, right? And in, in that case, we've learned that if that's the case, if our sample mean does reside in the critical region, we rightfully reject the null. The null says there is nothing happening. So we would be accurate in rejecting the null if that's the case. But we need to recognize, and I've stated this before, that in that normal distribution of sample means, those means do occur, that those sample means occurred because we selected individuals that were um, demonstrating extreme values in a distribution, and they collectively came together in a sample and produced a sample mean. So again, in the distribution, those values do occur, they occur very infrequently, and therefore, if we do obtain a sample mean out in those tails, it leads us to believe that the difference between here and here is due to treatment, or here and here is due to treatment. But we must recognize that the, those sample means do exist um, in the normal distribution. Um, if the, the null hypothesis is true, again, the null stating that there's no difference, no change. And consequently, we may be misled to believe that a difference um, has occurred due to treatment when the difference was simply due to chance. For instance, we took a sample and just by chance, um, the process of random selection, we selected individuals that already demonstrated extreme values to begin with. 
we administer the treatment and then we calculate their average and then are led to believe that collectively that average is due to treatment. Let's go back to the example of the electric stimulation um, that is hypothesized to improve math um, skills. So we take a group, let's say 25 individuals, and we administer this electric stimulation. We have them take the standardized math test. They, they produce a very high standardized test score on average collectively, but it was due to the fact that by chance those were already the high-performing individuals to begin with. So the sample that was selected was already an extreme sample. We wouldn't know that going into the research. We administer the treatment and that therefore we, when we see the high average on their um, math assessment standardized tests, um, we, we rightfully think that it was due to treatment. But we have to understand that it would, may have just been due to chance. And so this last point that says the alpha level is the probability that a test will lead to an alpha of type 1 simply means that whatever your alpha is equal to, so alpha set will equal probability of a type 1 error. Because again, if this were 95% in the center where we would fail to reject the null, there's 5% left over. And um, let me rewrite that somewhere else. 5%, right, across those two tails, right, those, those values do occur. And there's a 5% chance that we would obtain extreme value simply by chance. So therefore, you should be able to see that the alpha level set um, is equal to the chance of obtaining or committing a type 1 error. That, that they're equivalent to one another. Similarly, if, if I had set alpha of 1% um, and there's 99% in the center, there's a 1% chance that I'm going to commit a type 1 error because those sample means do occur and they, ha they occur 1% of the time in this distribution of sample means. Um, but we, we are um, thinking that the, the majority of the time those extremes are due to treatment and not due to chance, but there is that small chance, um, whatever alpha is set at, that we, by um, random selection, are conducting our research on individuals that already demonstrate some extreme values to begin with. So again, to summarize, a type 1 error is simply saying that some, that um, we say something is happening, that the treatment was effective, that there's a difference in the groups that are defined by the quasi-independent variable when there really is not, that we have drawn those conclusions in error. The second type that, of error that is possible is referred to as a type 2 error. In this case, the researcher fails to reject a null hypothesis that is really false. The researcher um, failed to detect any real treatment effect so visually, what does this look like? Well, we have our distribution, and we have our mean in the center. Again, we have our critical region set. And let's say our sample mean fell over here. Now, statistically speaking, that would be considered a common sample mean. And um, in that case, we would rightfully, right, if it falls in this region, we would fail to reject the null, that would be the accurate conclusion. Again, if it doesn't fall in the critical region in these tails, right, we must fail to reject the null. But that may be due to error. It may be due to the small sample that we selected. There are a lot of uh, reasons um, that would contribute or variables that would contribute to a false conclusion. Um, so again, we are stating that there is no treatment effect when there really is a treatment effect and our test just wasn't able to detect those true differences. So we can say that a type 2 error means that um, in error the researcher concludes that there 
isn't a treatment effect. or true difference between groups defined by the quasi-independent variable, again, for example, males versus females. Okay, and again, in error, they're drawing those conclusions. So again, visually speaking, if our sample mean falls in that area, uh, we are this white area here. Um, let's just make it a different color so you know what I'm talking about. This was a blue area here, then we would have to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Um, and it may have been simply due to the fact that our sample size wasn't large enough. Um, the sample mean didn't show a great enough difference, and um, consequently, we weren't able to detect true differences or true treatment effect or difference between the groups defined by the quasi-independent variable. Unlike type 1, there isn't um, a, a, an easy way of identifying the probability of engaging in type 2 error. Again, for type 1, the alpha um, level defines the probability of engaging in a type 1 error. It's not as simple when we are talking about a type 2 error. There's not an equivalent um, probability to be determined. Um, but we will talk more about type 2 or, or what we refer to as beta when we discuss power in a subsequent video. So again, in short, type 2 error simply says that we conclude nothing happened, no change, um, but that conclusion was drawn in error due to some variable, some mistake that, that occurred. Now, before we move on, I want to pose a question to you. Which type of error do you think is more consequential or has a, more, um, has a greater negative impact? Type 1 error or type 2? Again, which is more consequential or which has a greater negative impact? If you answered type 1, you would be correct. And the reason is that, let's go back to the slide for type 1. What are we doing if we engage in type 1 error? Well, we're saying that there was a treatment effect or that there's a difference between the um, groups defined by the quasi-independent variable. So let's go back to the example of the um, electric stimulation um, scenario, which we would hypothesize to increase math skills. And let's say in error, we conclude that the electric stimulation, electric brain stimulation, is effective, that the treatment had an effect. But let's say we engage in a type 1 and those conclusions were um, not correct. They were made in error. What do you think is going to happen if I say that this br brain stimulation um, is effective in improving math skills. If you think that people are going to start engaging in this treatment, then you would be correct. If a researcher concludes that a treatment is effective, people are going to change behavior. Individuals are going to engage in that type of treatment. They're going to administer that type of treatment and expect results. So if we engage in a type 1 error, we see that it's more consequential, it's more detrimental, it has greater negative implications because people will change behavior and start to engage in that type of treatment. Similar with the administration of a drug. Let's say we test a new antidepressant drug. The researcher concludes that the drug is effective. Um, let's say they engage in a type 1 error. They drew those conclusions in error and the drug really wasn't effective. What do you think is going to happen? Well, if they don't recognize they've engaged in a type 1 error, individuals, doctors are going to prescribe this drug, patients are going to take the drug, and again, we're, we're engaging in behavior that may be detrimental, that we may be taking a drug that really wasn't effective. So type 1 error is m much more consequential and, and it has more negative implications. Um, a type 2 error, let's talk about this. Let's say that the uh, researcher concludes that the brain stimulation 
it has an effect on math skills. If we say that the treatment was ineffective, do you think that um, individuals are going to change behavior? Do you think that they're going to start asking for this brain stimulation to be administered to them to improve their math skills? Well, the answer would be no, because the researcher has concluded that it was ineffective and therefore people are not going to change behavior. Similarly with the example of the antidepressant drug, if the researcher concludes that the drug was not effective, and granted it may have been an error that they drew those conclusions, but nonetheless, if the researcher says that the drug was not effective, the doctor is not going to prescribe the drug, the patient is not going to take the drug. Um, in other words, behavior will not change. Um, what What is detrimental or consequential is, is that we missed an opportunity, right? If the researcher um, engages in a type 2 error, they fail to detect two true differences, well, it's a missed opportunity because if the brain stimulation does improve math skills or if the drug does decrease depression, we missed out on the opportunity to help individuals. Um, but again, it's not as um, consequential in terms of saying something did work when it really did not. So keep that in mind. You may be asked a question along those lines, which one is more detrimental, um, a type 1 or type 2 error, and hopefully these examples will help you differentiate between the two. Table 8.1 may help um, some of you visual learners um, to understand the difference. So let's say that, so the researcher's decision is over here on the left. So let's say the researcher rejects the null. They say something is happening. But the actual situation is that there is no effect, right? So where these two correspond means that we've engaged in a type 1 error. We said something was happening, right? We rejected the null, but really there, was, there wasn't anything happening. There was no treatment effect or difference. And um, um, consequently, we engage in a type 1 error. If we reject the null, right, and the effect really truly does exist, then our decision is correct to reject the null. Um, if the researcher fails to reject the null, that means they're saying there wasn't um, enough evidence um, to support that there's a treatment effect, and there really was no effect, um, here, no effect, then the decision is correct, right? We, we said there was no effect, there was no effect, our decision is correct. Now, let's say we fail to reject the null, meaning that there's, we, we weren't able to detect any treatment effect, but the effect really does exist, and therefore we've engaged in a type 2 error. So again, where these two things intersect, and then when these two things intersect, so type 2 error is often referred to as beta, and we'll talk about beta when we discuss the power of a hypothesis test in a, in a later video. I'm not sure. Sometimes this, this table confuses individuals, and for others, it's the light bulb that makes uh, complete sense. So we can um, use, utilize it if necessary. Again, sometimes it's um, a good aid for the visual students. Um, but you don't have to rely on this. Sometimes just writing it out of what it means to reject or fail to reject a null hypothesis and the def definition of a type 1 versus type 2 is um, more beneficial to other types of learners. Figure 8.5 shows how the boundaries for the critical region move farther into the tails as alpha decreases. Notice that the z value equal to 0 in the center of the distribution corresponds to the value of mu specified in the null hypothesis. The boundaries of the critical region determine how much distance between the sample mean and mu is needed to reject the null hypothesis. As the alpha level gets smaller, the distance gets larger. So again, we're saying as the alpha level decreases from 5% to 1%, notice that the distance, right, from here to here now increases to here. Similarly, if it decreases from 1% um, to 0.01%, also we see that the 
distance from the center to this required z value increases. But what does it mean for the critical region? So let me erase that. Um, what does it mean for the critical region as alpha decreases? And we did discuss this earlier. So when alpha decreases from 5% to 1% here, the critical region, right, initially includes all of this, right? And then we move to 1%, and now the critical region only includes this area. Right, so the critical, as the alpha decreases, the critical region also decreases. What does that mean in terms of the uh, viability or ability to reject the null? In other words, does the test become more difficult to pass as alpha decreases, decreases or is it easier to pass? If you answer that the test becomes more difficult to pass, you are correct because as you see alpha decreasing, we see the z values increasing in numeric value, right? Over here on the negative, the numeric value is increasing. Of course, if it's negative, um, th there's a different interpretation of that, but the, the, the value itself is increasing, meaning that you need a, a sample mean that's much further from the center and that produces a larger z value, and, and consequently, it's more difficult to find those values because the probability of those values is much sl smaller. Again, this is, don't lose sight of the fact that this is frequency and these Z values all pertain to um, a probability of occurrence. So larger um, alpha levels, right, if we're talking about this opposed to 1%, a 5% alpha test is easier to pass than a 1% alpha level. Again, it has to do uh, and is related to the size of the critical region. The 5%, right, has a larger critical region, meaning there are more values in that region than when we decrease our alpha to 1% um, or 0.01%. So these um, values all were all derived from the unit normal table, and we've gone through um, the process of finding 1.96, positive and negative, in several examples thus far. Um, and that was derived by looking at 95% in the center and recognizing that that leaves 47.5% here and 47.5% here. And we use the unit normal table to find those values. The same process was utilized to find these um, identified Z values of negative 2.58, positive 2.58, positive negative 3.30. These will never change, so I highly recommend that you um, have these in your notes readily available when you're doing your homework problems and obviously on, in a test um, situation because you don't want to go through the process of finding those z-scores every time you're conducting a hypothesis test. These are the most common z-value, excuse me, alpha levels that we'll be utilizing. In fact, these two are, are the more common um, ones that you'll see in our textbook. So resorting these val these Z values to memory is, is a good idea, and if you don't want to memorize them, just have this slide um, or diagram in your notes and something that you can refer to quickly when you're um, solving a homework or exam item. Now these uh, Z values are all um, in relation to what we refer to as non- directional. So non-directional hypothesis, um, also referred to as two-tailed. And I've uh, mentioned this before, the way that the, the hypothesis is phrased will determine if it's non-directional or directional. So a two-tailed test or non-directional test would be stated as follows. The electric stimulation will have an effect on math scores. Notice I didn't say it would improve um, the math scores, I simply just said that it will have an effect, meaning that if my sample mean is over here or over here in the critical region, I get to reject the null hypothesis. Most research begins at a two-tailed level or a non-directional level, um, and the reason is that a two-tailed test is harder to pass 
compared to a one-tailed test. I will show you the Z values for a one-tailed test in just a minute. But um, again, most research, you have to have strong justification to begin a hypothesis test at the one-tailed level or directional level simply because it, it will be an easier test to pass. So most research is going to begin at the non-directional level, a two-tailed test, and be stated in that manner where we just are, are anticipating a treatment effect, but we do not identify the direction of that effect. These are the z-scores for one-tailed or directional hypothesis. And um, notice I have a positive negative value. But if we were to hypothesize that the electric stimulation will increase math scores, then we would concentrate on the positive um, side of the distribution, z-scores that are on the right side. And the cutoff for alpha at 5% is 1.65 positive. For um, 0.01 alpha, it's 2.33. And for 0.001 alpha, it's 3.08. So those are the minimum z-scores that you that would define the critical region. Similarly, um, if we were hypothesizing that it, let's say the electric stimulation decreases math scores, then we would focus on the left side of the distribution and look for um, values on the negative side. And these are the equivalent um, z-values according to those specific alpha levels. So these were um, obtained from the unit normal table. The 1.65, again, alpha at 5%, basically says that the, at minimum we have 95% in the body. For 2.33, um, 2 the body consists of 99% in the body. And then for 3.08, that means that, um, and let me just make this a little bit smaller so I have some room. So again, this body is consistent of 99%. And for 3.08, that means at minimum, we have 99.9% .9 of the body um, represented. And the tails are made up of those proportions or percentages that are denoted by the alpha. So you can look up these values. Um, if you look up these alpha levels in the tail, you should see the, these minimum values corresponding in the body. Again, these values will never change, so this is a good um, this is good information to have in your notes. That if you're conducting a one-tailed test at alpha five percent, one percent, or 0.01 percent, these um, are the cutoff values for the critical region. So again, have these handy in your notes during the test situation. And here we'll end with a hypothesis testing summary. We've learned the four-step procedure necessary to engage in an objective hypothesis test. Step one was to state the hypotheses, which include the research and the null hypothesis. So the null and the research. And we select um, the alpha level, which leads us to step two, which is locating the critical region. Again, the critical region is defined by our alpha level. Step three, we collect the data and compute the um, test statistic, which includes first calculating the mean of our sample and then our z-score. We convert that value into a um, standardized value that represents the difference between that sample and the hypothesized population mu. And then step four, we make um, a probability based on the null. We reject the null if the test statistic is unlikely, meaning it's in the tails, um, when the null is true. And we call that as being significant or statistically significant. Um, again, our conclusions are, is this sample mean due to chance or is it due to statistical significance of um, a treatment effect? And again, our goal is to reject the null. We hope that we are lucky enough to reject the null, but that's not always going to be the case. But again, we are going to draw conclusions based on the two options. We reject or fail to reject the null, and that is grounded on the location of the sample mean that we obtain from the data that has been collected. So that concludes this um, video for Chapter 8. And in the next video, we'll, we'll discuss um, some other elements um, that pertain to the hypothesis test 
which include how it's reported in um, APA format and assumptions that are required to engage in a hypothesis test or uh, what we refer to as a Z-test.